Hello, good afternoon. Hello. Could you please mute your phones, please? Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Krishan Aroda. I'm a program director here at the Center for Research Capacity Building at National Institute of General Medical Sciences at National Institutes of Health. So welcome to this pre-application webinar for this uh, funding announcement, RFA GM-18-001, Regional Technology Transfer Accelerator Hubs for Idea States. This funding announcement was published uh, last month on October 20th. This is a new initiative that is designed to promote biomedical entrepreneurship. Overall, the goal of this initiative is to develop and nurture current and future biomedical entrepreneurs who can translate the basic discoveries and address the advances to marketplace to improve and enhance the human life. During this webinar, NIGMS and Center for Scientific Review staff will explain the goals and objectives of the initiative and also other application requirements and also answer your questions. The webinar presenters are listed on this, uh, on this slide. The order of presentation will be, uh, the first part will be presented by the program staff, myself and Dr. Joe Ginhart. That will be followed by a review, a peer review a consider consideration by Dr. Alan Zishon at Center for Scientific Review. That will be followed by uh, Christy Leake, who is a team leader at the Grant Management Office at NIGMS. So starting with the program part, the intent of this initiative is to score one shared regional technology transfer accelerator hub in each of the four IDEA regions that will serve as a network of institutions in, the, in, the, in that region. These hubs will serve as a regional consortia to provide expertise to develop the infrastructure and promote an entrepreneurial culture at the IDEA institution in that region. Just to remind you that uh, there are 23 uh, states and Puerto Rico that are IDEA eligible states. These 24 entity, entities, they have been classified, uh, grouped into four, uh, four uh, regions, which are labeled as Western region, Central region, Northeast region, and Southeast region. For example, the Western region includes seven states, which are Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, New Mexico, Alaska, and Hawaii. So, so each region has five, five states or seven states, depending upon their location. The purpose of these hubs will be to develop, implement, and test a comprehensive program to promote entrepreneurship, technology transfer, intellectual property, managing business, small business finance, and other business skills that are needed to move basic discoveries and technology out of the lab and into the marketplace. The goal will be also to generate education and training tools that will include curricula, text, webinar, and modules from the developing, development and testing of the research accelerator models. These hubs will facilitate networking and team formation between the universities and small businesses, sharing and transferring information best practices and guidelines. The target applicant for these uh, hubs uh, application, they, they will be a, a small business company, SBC, that could be located anywhere in the US, whether from idea state or non idea state, and this, that SBC will be required to partner with academic institution in the idea state to create this regional network. A successful hub should be an inclusive network engaging all the states in that region. The next slide shows this in scheme wise that this there is a small business company that could be located anywhere in the US, idea or no idea state, 
which will partner with one academic institution in say state one and that will be partnering with other uh, institution in that in that in the in the state in that region to create this regional network <laughs> these hubs will have a mechanism which is will be STTR, Small Business Technology Transfer Research Mechanism, UT2 Mechanism. This will mechanism is a, is a, is a, is a cooperative agreement mechanism and it's a fast track mechanism. Fast track means that it will involve both the phases of STTR program, STTR phase one, which will be for up to one year, followed by phase two, which will be for two years. Also this mechanism is cooperative agreement mechanism that means that the program staff from NIH will have substantial involvement in the program activities. Once they are program funded, staff will assist, guide, coordinate, or participate in the project activities as needed and as appropriate. In terms of funding, these hubs for phase one up to $500,000 total cost per year is allowed, and for phase two is up to $1.5 million total cost Per years. This slide shows the important dates for the application. The one to be highlighted is the, in the which is in the red, the application due date, which are due on January 5th, 2018. And the slide also lists the dates for the uh, scientific merit review when the application will be reviewed. Uh, there will be two levels of reviews. Uh, one is the initial uh, peer review, which will be sometime in March 2018, and that will be followed by the uh, advisory council uh, review by uh, at NIGMS, which will, uh, will be happening in May 2018. So the meritorious application, they will be funded by September 2018. The letter of intent due date is listed here as a December 5th. By that date, listed, uh, which is one month prior to the application receipt dates, prospective applicants are encouraged to submit a letter of intent that includes the information listed on this slide. And the title of the proposed activity, name, address, and telephone number of the program director or the principal investigator, name of the other key personnel, participating institution, and number and title of this funding opportunity. Information that's contained in the letter of intent allows staff to estimate the potential review workload and plan the review. The next part will be uh, presented by Dr. Joe Kinhart. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to make two quick announcements. Uh, first, uh, please make sure that your your microphone is muted, um, and we can always unmute later. But um, we we hear some sounds come ambient sound coming through. And then secondly, uh, these slides will be made available, but a lot of this information is already found in the funding announcement. Um, so I'll uh, I'll get started now. Um, the characteristics of the regional accelerator hubs. That is, what are we looking for? Why did we write this funding announcement? Um, we're looking for um, uh, teams that have uh, strong leadership. Um, we want teams that are collaborative, uh, hubs that uh, strengthen existing resources and fill in gaps um, in the uh, innovation environment, if you will, um, that uh, these, these hubs should uh, provide training in both hard and soft skills for faculty and for uh, students at the institutions in, in, in the participating, uh, yeah, that, that are participating in the program. Um, the hub should uh, try to work with existing state and local resources. And then finally, there should be a plan for sustainability. This is a three-year program. How are you going to keep this going after um, after the, the NIH goes away? Um, some of the, okay, next slide, please. Um, so to, to go into this in a little more depth, um, we want um, the, to use, you to use the funding um, that is provided in this fund, in this announcement to um, 
leverage with existing NIGMS and NIH funded programs such as COBRI, INBRI, and the IDEA CTR program and IDEA States, um, REACH and NCAI centers, which are innovation hubs that are funded um, in other parts of the NIH, uh, CTSAs, and um, cancer centers. Um, and then also, too, to, to, to try to build partnerships with small business development centers in the state and local government, um, economic development and administration offices, and um, others as, as are appropriate for where you are. Um, next slide. Um, so the yeah, institutional uh, commitment uh, and regional uh, support um, that the uh, police meet your phone. Thanks. Um, the institutional um, commitment and regional support that we'd like to see uh, are things like adequate laboratory space. Um, perhaps seed money for pilot projects at institutions, although this is an optional uh, component, and we'll get into this in a little more detail later, uh, to change uh, the entrepreneurial environment at um, research institutions by um, do, get, allowing faculty release time for business development um, and commercialization um, activities and recognition in terms of things like um, uh, using innovate, innovation um, in, in uh, entrepreneurial act activities as uh, a, a criterion for tenure uh, and promotion. Um, we want to see uh, the creation of undergraduate and graduate courses in biomedical technology research development and entrepreneurship. And then um, finally, uh, see commitment from local or regional sources and that could either be uh, in kind or just, you know, letters of support. How are they going to help you? Um, as far as the leadership team, um, the big the, the big take home from this is can the investigator do the work? Do they have a track record of success? And does the um, does the the research plan itself and commercialization plan provide a, a level of confidence that if uh, awarded, that the, um, the the grant would help us uh, help us um, help you achieve your goals. Um, next one. So the what, what's the the structure of these hubs? So the hub needs um, a governance team, and that consists of the PI and the the leadership from the idea partner institutions. And then there's a series of committees, and just this this is, is is described in much more detail in the funding announcement itself. But there's an administrative committee uh, that's composed of the principal investigators and the small business concerned staff, um, an internal advisory committee that uh, is composed of the uh, the PI and small business concerned staff, and um, and and members. Um, from other institutions in the uh, IDEA Innovation Hub. And then, of course, you need uh, some help from the outside world, so there would be an external advisory committee of local experts. And then, finally, um, a program steering committee, which is a subset of members of all of these other committees um, with NIH staff involvement. Okay, and then, um, okay, next slide, thanks. So, uh, some of the hub activities, this is just a, an, a a sampling of some of the things that uh, you could do um, during the course of the award. Um, you would, we would like to see development of educational and training materials, um, skills development, mentoring and coaching, um, internships, uh, consulting and advising of, um, of uh, investigators uh, that, that have ideas that, that could be commercialized. Um, to help people learn how to prepare an SBI or STTR application. So, SBIR grants um, have a phase one uh, of award and a phase two award. These would be phase zero activities, if you want to think about it that way. Um, once again, changing the culture a little bit uh, to create an entrepreneurial culture in which these sorts of activities are not, not um, treated either neutrally or negatively, but, but positively. Um, and then, um, once again, to bolster the tech transfer and commercialization offices in the region. And then, you know, we'd like to see your ideas, too. So what, what, what can you bring to the table? What are your neat ideas? We'd like to know more about that. And then, uh, let's see, next slide. So um, 
<coughs> excuse me. So, the some of the what are the milestones of success for this for this funding announcement? Um, we would like to see, you know, you could measure things like the numbers of uh, the number of faculty who are participating in this, um, the development of uh, curriculum and skills development materials, uh, number of patents, number of licensing agreements, uh, increase in tech transfer uh, from from time zero to to at some point during the course of the awards. Um, you could, we could look at the number of startups um, focused on biotechnology that were launched from this award. And some of these, I should note that some of these milestones couldn't be measured, you know, in year one of the award or year two of the award, but these might be things that we could measure five years out. Um, <coughs> let's see. And then, um, you know, so the long-term long goal is to uh, increase biotech-related jobs and economic activity in idea states. All right. Okay, so what's the application going to look like? So um, Alan will speak about this a little bit, I think, but um, the specific games page, of course, and then there's a research strategy, which is 12 pages long, and that has what you would expect. There's sections on leadership and governance, collaborations and partnerships, uh, skills development writ large, uh, plans for sustainability, um, program e evaluation, and then once again, there's more information about this um, in, in the RFA itself, but uh, pilot projects. And then the commercialization plan, um, I, we didn't leave the information out um, of this slide. It, the commercialization plan is the same that you would find in a, in a regular STTR application. And so if you have some familiarity with that, you can, uh, you can look into that. Um, and then, um, let's see. So, um, um, finally, uh, part one of the one of the components of institutional commitment could be uh, these pilot projects, um, which are, as we'd like to emphasize again, an optional element of the hub. You can't use federal funding um, to support this activity. So we are um, sympathetic to the notion that some consortia may have. Um, more funds to do pilot projects than others, but that will not be a um, a, a score driving um, a score driving issue. Um, the pilot projects um, are intended to demonstrate the feasibility and proof of concept studies for innovative products, biomarkers, or diagnostics. Um, the pilot projects would not be proposed in the application itself. So if you were intending to do pilot projects during the course of the project, you would talk in the application about how you would solicit applications for pilot projects and how pilot projects would be selected, but not like what the specific projects are themselves. Um, and uh, okay, so I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Krishan. Yes, so as Joe mentioned that, you know, the application uh, will include a number of components and uh, as all the, these hubs will be partnering and collaborating with a number of uh, institutions in the ideal states and also the number of other entities, for local or state resources. So it will be important to include letter of support uh, that will highlight, that, that should highlight how these hubs will leverage existing resources and also avoid duplicating the efforts in their, uh, in their own hub activities. And because some of the resources may be available at the state level or uh, local level that could be used by the hub. So there's no need to uh, duplicate those uh, same resources or uh, activities. So in terms of the lateral support, it could be from the letters from the number, uh, academic partners or consultants, uh, contractors and collaborators as appropriate, uh, which are needed uh, for the hub to meet the goals and objective of the proposed project. Also, the letter of support from the uh, senior leadership at the academic partner institution will be also critical. And they should, those letters should outline the resources and the facilities that will be committed by that institution to support and sustain the retail hub throughout the period of funding and beyond. And also, uh, this letter of support could be also included from the uh, the program that the hub will be uh, participating or uh, leveraging the resources from the idea supported activity like COBRI, INBRI, IDEA CTR, 
or other uh, centers reach to the funded to the reach are uh, NCI centers. So those data should be included with the application. Uh, also, that is indicating the support or resources that are available from the state or local government agencies or other groups such as business development organization that could be partnering uh, in the hub activities, they, can, they should be also uh, included. So, as I mentioned earlier, that the, this is a fast track uh, uh, application, which we have both phase one and phase two. And uh, to transition from phase one to phase two, there will be administrative review by the NIGMS program staff, and there's a specific milestone and criteria uh, which uh, the hub has to meet for entering from phase one to phase uh, phase two. So these are listed on this slide, but they are just taken straight from the funding opportunity announcement, uh, which include that uh, there should be functional uh, committees, as Joe mentioned, that there are a number of committees for each for the proposed hub, uh, the administrative committee, internal advisory committee, program steering committee, and the external advisory committee. They should have been all established uh, in terms of the hub structure, governance, and leadership plan. Secondly, uh, the, on the contractual arrangements between the academic partners in the IDEA region, or the memorandum of understanding should have been established in the phase, during the phase one uh, phase, for phase, phase one stage. Also, during the phase one stage, the uh, need assessment in terms of the infrastructure for, for the academic partners and how they are going to be addressed. Uh, the implementation, implementation plan should also be um, formulated. So the goal is to develop research capacity uh, and uh, infrastructure to promote uh, biomedical entrepreneurship at this institution in the region. Also, in terms of that, because this is an educational program to uh, mentor and consulta consulting uh, the faculty who are innovative and who want to translate the basic discoveries uh, to marketplace. So in terms of the what kind of skills that they need to learn, and what are the learning needs are there, and what are available in the local ecosystem, uh, the resources for this relevant content, and also what are the plans for developing additional content uh, for education and uh, workshop and webinar, et cetera. So that criteria should also be met in the phase from phase, for, for moving from phase one to phase two. Also during the phase one, uh, the hub should develop a prototype in terms of training and educational resources for faculty, postdoc fellows, graduate students, and undergraduate students. Also to uh, establish a system for uh, delivering the webinar, uh, webinars, organizing the webinar, and visiting the academic institution for outreach. So that criteria should be also met from uh, transitioning from phase one to phase two. The so goal is to uh, support four uh, regional hubs, uh, which are shown here again on the this US map, highlighting the four regions. For example, this is shown on the Western region, the hub, which will be partnering with all these seven states in the region. Similarly, for the ne next uh, central region, the hub could be located anywhere in the uh, state, and then they will be partnering with the five states in the central region. The next one is like a, the southeast region. So again, that, that, that will be partnering with the southeast states. And the, the fourth one is a, will be the say, northeast region, and that will be partnering with the five states in the northeast region. And it's also expected that these four hubs will be interacting among themselves also, so sharing and leveraging the resources that will be created through these hub activities. So I'll pass it on to know uh, Dr. Alan Rishon, uh, who is a scientific review officer. Thank you. Here. Good afternoon. Um, go ahead and put the slide. I have been running SBIR reviews for about nine years at NIH, and so this is kind of bread and butter for us. We look forward to working with everyone. Um, what happens when your application comes in? You're going to spend time putting it together. You'll upload it via the um, USA Jobs or the gov, grants.gov website, and it will go to the Division of Procedure for Referral. 
Um, from there, it will be sent to me because I am the scientific contact review officer for this particular RFA. And once it gets into my hands, then I'll be putting together a panel. And I think you'd probably like to know what are the various parts. Next. Um, I will act as the federal official who is responsible for the process. That means I have the legal responsibility for making sure that all the rules, regulations, best practices, and so on are followed. Um, I will also perform administrative review of the applications to make sure they're complete and make sure that they are accurate and comply with the requirements. I will then find reviewers um, once we get them together and I'll just have a talk about that in a bit. I will manage how the study section is run and then take those results, prepare summary statements, and send them both to you and to program. Next one, please. Um, I'll be working closely with the study section chair, who is a senior level scientist, um, probably somebody that has their foot in two worlds. Um, this will be someone that who's dealt with technology transfer in their past lives been in small companies, been in large companies, worked in academics, um, and so on. That person is going to be responsible for actually conducting the meeting, guiding the discussion, making sure that all points are heard, making sure that all opinions are heard, and then just managing the overall process. In addition, can I have the next one, please? We will have an ESA or extramural support assistant. This is the person that will be making sure that program um, officials can hear the meeting, that the telephones are running well, manages travel if we have that particular aspect of it, and then shares um, the administrative responsibilities. So, and then finally, the panel. What we look for is expertise that matches the content of the application. So in this case, we are going to need scientists that have expertise in a wide variety of areas, people that are mature, i.e. they've been in the career for a while, they've seen a lot of things in the course of their career, so they have a breadth of perspective, um, they will be impartial, and we try as best as possible to get academicians and industry experts. Uh, we want at least 25 to 50% to be from small businesses or from tech transfer, we also make sure that we have women and minority scientists that are geographically distributed. Uh, and especially for this one, we will be finding people that have commercialization and technology experience both in academic centers as well as the industrial institutions. I mean, I don't know if you're aware that large pharma has entire divisions, entire groups that are responsible for bringing technology into the organization from small businesses from academic centers and so on. And those are the kinds of people we're looking for because they'll be able to have an informed opinion on what makes a successful center. Next slide, please. Okay. Each application that we get will get three or more reviewers and they reviewers will have access to the applications five to six weeks in advance. Um, during that five or six weeks, they constantly get bombarded by me, reminding them that they've got responsibilities to make sure that these things are done. Um, we try and have the applications and their comments on it uploaded to the system a week before the actual meeting so that everyone has a chance to read the comments and get an informed opinion on each application. And the reviewers will be responsible for providing an overall impact score, and I'll tell you about what that means in just a bit as well as criterion scores on the various um, review criteria sections. They will provide a written critique. So each person that submits an application gets a view of their application from three different independent reviewers. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the criteria that we're talking about are pretty standard in all small business applications. And it's basically how significant is the work Who's the team that's going to carry it out? What level of innovation do they bring to the table and how they're trying to approach the problem? How are they actually approaching the problem and do they have the environment to do it? And basically what we're saying is, tell us if what your idea is, is, tell us why you think it's a good idea, tell us why you think you're the person that can carry this off, tell us how you're going to do it using the best technology that's out there and put it together in innovative ways. Tell us what you're going to do if you encounter problems, what things you're going to try and work around, um, how well you're going to plan it, and tell us how the environment that you're putting together is going to help to accomplish the objective. 
And that all boils down to the overall impact. And if you read the RFA, it's to assess the likelihood that, that hub is going to function as a way of bringing technology out of the region and then do it in such a way that innovations get developed and distributed to the U.S. through your particular institution. Each of those five criteria gets a score from one to nine, one being best, nine being worst, and the overall impact is also one to nine. When all of these scores come in, the three reviewer scores will be averaged, and then the applications will be rank ordered, and that will be the discussion order. So we'll start with the best scoring application and work our way through to the one that doesn't score as well. Um, depending on how many we get, we will cut off at a 50% level. I doubt that we're going to hit that level with this particular RFA. Um, in our standard small business application panels, we have somewhere between 60 and 100 applications, and, and it gets really tough to try and talk about every one of them. So um, that's how we, we make the cutoff. And the next one, please. Okay, in addition to those five areas, with this RFA, there are other areas that will be considered as score driving, and they will contribute to a score for either a significance or approach, but they won't be scored individually. And that is going to be how well is the impact of the hub described and the organization of the hub described, what skills and educational programs do you bring into the system, how are you going to develop those, um, how are you developing the, tech, the capability to bring technology transfer to the region? How well do you manage projects? How well do you mentor? Um, what consulting arrangements are you going to make? How are you going to advise people? What kinds of programs are you going to put in place to make sure that these things are done? That is going to form the core of a lot of the discussion, frankly. Um, next, please. In addition, um, this is a fast track. And that means that it has to have two distinct phases. In phase one, you're basically setting the stage for the work that you're going to do in stage two. So we need to know from you, or the reviewers need to know from you, what are you doing in phase one, and how are you going to measure whether you're successful or not. Now, those milestones should be clear, they should be appropriate to what you're trying to do, and they should be quantifiable and measurable. So, you know, nothing really washy like wishy-washy like, well, we're going to try and do a seminar or two. Um, tell us how many, what kinds of things you're going to approach. You know, the more specific it can be, the better the reviewers are going to respond to it. And so once you have met those goals, you can put together a report that's sent to the program. They'll evaluate how well you've done, and then you go into phase two. And that's where the actual guts of the work gets done. So we need to see the transition. And Keep in mind, when these things, when fast tracks come into small business study sections, reviewers are really tough when they don't see a distinct phase one and phase two. So that's just a warning ahead of time. Um, next, please. Commercialization. Um, you have 12 pages to describe what you're doing. You've got 12 pages to describe how you're going to roll it out as a, as a self-sustaining product. Uh, what we like to see in the review panels are who are the people that are going to do this, and do they have the qualifications to manage it? Um, do they have a commercialization strategy so they've got some way to measure how they're going to get it out there? They have some way to make sure that it becomes self-sustaining. They have follow-on plans that say this is how we're going to fund it from years three to end. Uh, very important are letters of support. So from small businesses, from academic centers, from investors, from wherever you can find it, any strong letters of support that will show that your plan is meeting with the needs of the community at large will help to enhance your commercialization strategy. So, um, next one, please. Okay, there are, I doubt that we're going to be seeing these things, but if you are planning any human subject studies, and that could be things like surveys, it could be things like taking a seminar and getting feedback from the participants, those types of things are human subjects of studies. And so be sure that you look at what the protections required are. Those are in all the NIH documents. Uh, when you do that, you need to include representative sampling of the people in your region, so women, minorities, um, children, that's anyone under the age of 18 now. 
Um, vertebrate animals, I don't think we're going to be doing any squirrel cage studies here, so I don't think that's, appro that's appropriate. But I mean, basically, it's, there are four things that you need to cover. Um, I don't think we'll deal with any biohazards, but those are kind of the standard piece that's on every um, type of application that comes into small business. Uh, if it's not applicable, fine, but if you're planning on doing it, please check with the NIH documentation and see what you need to include. Next, please. There are other things that we ask reviewers to look at. They do not affect scores. They're non-scoring issues. Um, anytime that you're doing a large-scale application, if you're going to be generating data, if you're going to be generating new organisms, new model organisms, if you're going to collect genomic data, if you're going to involve foreign organizations, we need to understand what you're doing with those. So be sure that you cover those. Um, select agents, there's a list of them on the NIH website. I doubt you're going to be using any Ebola or things like that. Um, that's what those cover. And key biological and chemical resources is if you are going to start working in lab and you're planning on doing cell cultures, for example, Make sure you tell us that you've assayed those cells and that they are what you think they are. And then budget is the final piece. We ask reviewers simply to tell us, is the budget reasonable for the work that you're proposing? Um, they're not going to get into the minutia of the budget. That's a program's issue. They, we just advise program that, yes, the budget matches kind of the scope of the work that is being proposed. Okay. Next. Um, as I said, it's a one through nine. In general, we look at anything scored as a one, two, three as having a high impact, um, four to six is a medium impact, and seven to nine is a low impact. And you can see the, the descriptors there. Next, please. Okay. At the review meeting, um, one of the things that I think is the least understood by applicants is what happens, um, and unless you've gone through a study section, it's kind of a black box. The chair will poll the three primary reviewers and ask them to state their preliminary overall impact scores. Now, those are going to be the ones that they put down on their application and then may be slightly modified by what they've read that their colleagues have said as well. Um, reviewer one will spend the most time. They will introduce the application to the panel, say what's good and bad about it, say where the strengths lie, um, say what the overall objective is. And since most of these are similar types of activities, those objectives are pretty much going to be the same, I had, if I had to guess. Reviewers two and three will then offer any points that weren't covered by reviewer one. And at the end of that, the discussion is open to the entire panel. Um, given that there will probably be complementary expertise, I have a feeling we're going to have very active discussions during this. Uh, the whole panel is welcome to ask questions, make comments raise issues. That conversation will go on until all the topics are exhausted. And after it's finished, the chair will ask the primary reviewers to, take, to, to state excuse me, their final overall impact scores. And those are the scores that will be reported to program and to you. Once those scores are given, everyone on the panel is asked to score similarly. So it's a, it'll set a range. So if it's a one to three, that will be the range. The panel then will score within that range unless they hear something that they think they substantively disagree with. And it could be based on their research in the area. It could be any number of things. But reviewers are free to vote outside that range. We just ask that whatever the reason they're doing it has been discussed. And if it hasn't, then we reopen the discussion and we bring that point forward. Um, every piece of information needs to be considered for every application to arrive at the final score. So if we have 20 people on the panel, there will be 20 scores unless someone's in conflict and they'll be out of the room during this discussion. So those, those scores will be added together, averaged, and, and multiplied by 10, and that'll be your final overall impact score. Okay, next one, please. Um, once the meeting is finished, it's my responsibility to take all that was said during those discussions and boil it down to a paragraph or two that hits the highlights. That will be the resume of the discussion. It will be attached to the three critiques. I then go through and clean up all the, all the summary statements, make sure there's no bad grammar, make sure that there's no inaccuracy. If there's things missing, I will contact the reviewers that issued those um, critiques and say, hey, I need more information here. 
Um, that usually takes about two to four weeks after the meeting. The final overall impact score and then all of those will be sent to program and to you. And next. Okay. okay. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, next presenter is uh, Christy Lee. Uh, hi, everybody. I will be going over some budget considerations, um, required registrations, and eligibility um, for this FOA. So there are several required registrations uh, for the main applicant, which is the small business concern. Um, please uh, make sure to do these in advance. Several of these take several weeks to set up. So you want to make sure you have those in place well before the due date of January 5th. Uh, so you need to have your DUNS number, your system for award management, your SBA company registry, uh, an ERA Commons account, grants.gov access, as well as ensure that all of your PIs, your PD's PIs, have ERA Commons accounts. Um, so this, uh, there's actually quite a bit of eligibility um, that surrounds uh, grants for um, SBR, STTR awards. All of this information is well outlined in the FOA as well as uh, several websites. Um, so just please pay attention to that eligibility criteria to make sure you're eligible to apply for this funding opportunity. Uh, in addition, there are, um, for the STTR portion of this award, uh, the PD or PI chosen may be employed with the small business or the single partnering nonprofit research institution as long as she or he has a formal appointment with or a commitment to the applicant's small business concern. Uh, and for this FOA, multiple PD or PI arrangements is allowed. Next slide. Uh, so because this is an STTR, um, the small business concern will partner with one main research institution as well as several others. So for um, the phase one and the phase two, at least 40% of the research or analytical effort must be performed by the small business concern and at least 30% of the research or analytical effort must be performed by the single partnering research institution. The remaining 30% may be attributed to either the SBC, primary research institution, or additional third-party organizations. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the contractual arrangements or memorandum of understanding must be established between the SBC and the partnering institutions as part of the phase one scope. Uh, Krishan briefly mentioned the budget. Um, budgets of up to $500,000 total costs per year for phase one awards may be requested. And then for the phase two, budgets up to $1.5 million total cost per year may be requested. Um, please pay attention that this is a total cost cap on these awards, not direct costs. Um, and for a brief mention of the f and rates for the small business concerns, uh, phase one applicants who do not have a negotiated f and rate um, should propose an estimated rate not to exceed 40% of the total direct cost. Um, and a reasonable fee not to exceed 7% of the total cost, which includes the direct and the indirect for each phase of the project is available to the small business concern. Uh, this fee is intended to be a regional profit factor available for for-profit organizations. Um, so for um, budget considerations uh, specific to this FOA, each PDPI must commit a minimum of 10% effort to the project. Um, funds should be requested for the hub PDs and PIs and other hub staff as appropriate to attend the annual in-person program steering committee meeting in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, funds should be requested for the operations of the external advisory committee. And there's a long list of other allowable costs as described in the FOA um, that should uh, clear to the applicant. Uh, this slide I often put up for um, potential grantees, uh, potential applicants, as things to keep in mind when putting together an application. Um, these specific costs are things uh, that often jump out from my office, the grants management office. Um, the general thought is to make sure that all of your costs are well described and well justified and make sure that they are appropriate to the uh, 
proposal that you're submitting. Uh, additionally, if you have more questions about uh, costs, uh, the NIH Grants Policy Statement is a great um, tool to use. Uh, there's a section for selected items of cost, as well as uh, there's a section of the Uniform Guidance, um, selected items of cost that will be helpful as well. Thank you, Christy. So finally, to wrap up, the, just to uh, some reminders, the final reminders for the program. Uh, as you, uh, those pr prospective applicants uh, start you know, preparing this uh, application, I'd like to emphasize to read and follow all the instructions in the funding opportunity announcement and make sure that all the review criteria are addressed. Uh, and also some of the uh, features that I mentioned about the hub that is small business concern that could be located anywhere in the U.S. from an idea state or in an, or an known idea state. Uh, SBC must partner with academic institutions in idea states to create an inclusive regional technology transfer accelerator hub. And you can uh, include uh, consultants, experts, advisors, uh, coach, mentors uh, from idea or known idea state uh, as you deem appropriate to meet the goals and objective of this uh, funding announcement. Um, an application uh, also must include, uh, with a fast track mechanism, must include milestone that will be achieved for transitioning from phase one to phase two. Uh, also, just like remind you that the potential members, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, external advisory committee is a required committee for this uh, program for these hubs. So the potential members of this EAC should not be named and should not be contacted prior to the review of an application. Uh, but you may discuss in the application what type of expertise uh, these individuals will have that you'll be looking for, that you can discuss the expertise in the application, but not name or contact the EAC members and those EAC members. So finally, uh, the goal of this uh, initiative is to create this regional hub in each of the four IDEA regions that will be uh, interacting among themselves or within the institution as a state, and uh, that will be creating a educational program to develop the skills, uh, mentoring, coaching, consulting uh, to those uh, innovative uh, faculty at this institution, and to create this uh, and enhance this entrepreneurial e ecosystem that will provide education, uh, connections, and support to develop internal commercialization capacity that can facilitate the translation of discoveries and advances from lab to marketplace to meet the societal needs. So with that, uh, we'll stop here now and uh, we'll open for questions. Hello, I have a couple questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you for the information today. Very, very helpful, very useful. Um, the 12-page research strategy and the 12-page commercial plan, is that the requirement for um, the phase one and the phase two combined, or is that a requirement for each section, phase one and phase two, individually? You will have 12 pages to describe your research for both phase one and phase two, and then 12 pages as a commercialization bench, commercialization plan. It's an entire document. Okay, great, thank you. And um, it, it sounds like the expectation is to develop a prototype of courses in um, during the phase one portion of the research plan, and. Six, six months generally for phase one, as we know, that's a tall order to develop a prototype of a curriculum in six months. Am I understanding that requirement correctly? This one is for up to one year, so you have to 12 months. Oh, one year, okay, thank you. That makes more sense to me. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree, six months would be a short timeline. And on, um, Finding the university hub partner or the um, the research institution one on the diagram, um, if if universities are um, 
competing for the opportunity to be the hub in a region, it's going to be a challenge, I think, to find one university willing to be the hub and then um, the rest serving as um, supportive offshoots of that hub. Um, has that challenge been discussed in the with the team that developed the the topic or the um, the RFA? Yeah. So, so I, I think you know if you think about it in the context that the small business concern um, is forty percent forty percent of the budget. The first institution, the main institution, would have a minimum of thirty percent of the budget, and that would be the core of activity uh, of activities and then they would reach out those, those two gr groups working together would reach out to institutions in the other idea states so um, it's a, I, of course it, the arrow goes both ways that there will be some contribution from the from the the satellite institutions if you will um, to the to the, the the SBC and the the main institution, but um, we think that there's incentives for um, institutions to want to serve as the main main part of the hub. I don't know, Krishan. Do you want to? So I, I can also add to that that you know uh, just uh, through the idea program that we have been funding for the last 15 years, we encourage uh, networking and collaboration among these uh, institutions within the region and among the regions. So. Uh, I think they would like to kind of you know, uh, participate, you know, in this initiative and uh, partner within, uh, within the, as, a, as a hub uh, within the hub. Yeah. Does that does that answer your question? Hello. We have another question. Um, can we ask it? Sure. Could you say what the definition of an academic institution is for the purposes of this? Specifically, does it need to be a degree granting institution uh, or one which uh, has uh, meets other requirements such as advising students and having a large flow of tech transfer? The traditional definition has been an academic institution, a nonprofit organization, um, or there's one other piece there that, that escapes me at the moment, but it's not just a degree granting institution. Now whether the program wanted these to be specifically academic, I don't believe I saw that in the RFA. No, if you're if, if an institution is eligible to apply for an STTR grant or to participate to uh, to be the partner institution in an STTR grant, they should be able to apply to for this as well. I'm thinking specifically of a national laboratory. Ooh, that's a good one. We'll have to look into that. Thank you. You should reach out to us in about in a couple of days or even email us tonight, and uh, we'll. We'll follow up. I'll follow it up, yes. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'm curious um, as to what you're thinking in terms of the small business concern. Are you thinking of a small company? Are you thinking of a business incubator or an accelerator or what is your sort of thinking on those lines? Well, it would have to be. Krishan and I talked about this a couple of days ago. It would have. It would have to be a for-profit um, organization. Okay, that, cl that clarifies for me. Can you? Um, I'm sorry. Repeat the question and answer on that. Who has to be a for-profit institution? Oh, so the, I'm sorry. So the question is, um, what type of organization could be the the business concern? Does it have, would it be a company or could it be you know sort of a business um, tech innovation hub um, or a, a business development organization? 
and the the criterion for uh, the small business grants is that would it would have to be a for profit organi uh, organization. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, and I think Krishan now is going to read a couple of the the questions that w that we've gotten online. You want me to read it, Krishna? Yeah. Okay, so the first question that we got um, by uh, by uh, WebEx is, do the institutions representing each state need to be the homes of existing IMBRI or COBRI programs? Uh, no. They don't have to be the home for the IMBRI or COBRI program, but uh, uh, they could be partnering, you know, and uh, the, some of the resources that are been funded through the IDEA program, they can be leveraged at this, from this institution that are funded through the IDEA in pre program. And then uh, there's a question, is there an expectation that an academic institution collaborating with an SPC on this hub grant will have an existing track record of success with NIH grants, e.g. R01s and other NIH grants mentioned in the presentation? Um, I think that, uh, you know, there, there is the, if you look at the uh, criteria uh, for investigator, uh, the review criteria, that could play into it a little bit, but it certainly isn't the, the whole story that uh, we're looking for organizations that have the skills and the expertise to, to, um, to do this project regardless of their, their prior track record. Um, you should know that, um, Year, year after year, about a third of the small business grants that the NIH grants are to organizations that have never had an NIH grant before. The next question uh, that we received is, uh, can more than one institution share prime institution duties with the two or more MPIs, uh, which are multiple PIs? So um, the answer is that no, it would have to be one main small business concern. Um, that would be the prime institution. The whole point is that the, there be one small business that then partners with one research institution. Um, so there should just be one main SBC. Um, multiple PIs are allowed. It, it's up to you how you set up your multiple PI um, management plan. The next question is, uh, uh, can, one more, can one organization or individuals participate in more than one proposal submission within the region, or would this lead to the disqualification of the applications? Uh, if there are two, I mean, uh, two small business companies, uh, they are trying to uh, cre create a hubs in the same region, and they could partner with that uh, same institution, but with a different company. So we can have received two applications that way from two different SBC partnering with the same institution. Yeah, and, and we got into the, you know, it gets into the question of what counts as overlap in an NIH grant. And, you know, I, I, Alan might be able to speak some of this, but can you imagine that if one small business concern wrote two grants, both for innovation hubs in the southeast, I think maybe you would consider that overlap. Yes. But what if they wrote uh, an innovation hub for the north, the same small business concern wrote an application for an innovation hub in the northeast versus the central re and the central region. Maybe that wouldn't be overlap. I don't know. What, what do you think? DRR would consider that overlap. Would they? The okay. same type of activity. Okay. Even though it's in different areas. Okay. So the same. You. That's good. I, I was wrong. On that. The same one SPC cannot uh, partner with two different regions and right. submit two different applications. Right. So that's okay. There are multiple applications from an IDEA region. Can a given institution participate with the, that two different small business concerns in the two different applications? So do you mean say let's just not to, to, to let's just say the, the yeah that the, the University of Kentucky has two applications, one with two different companies? Yeah, if the company, if two different companies put approach the same institution, and the company submitting the application, right. can those two, can those mm. institutions be on both of those applications? That's a tough one. I don't, I don't know 
the answer to that. I think I was gonna, gonna, yeah. yeah. I think they can be up because they're different. We're only going to find one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so the so we think that so the question was I don't know if you heard it um, so could an individual institution partner or send in multiple applications and I don't think that the funding announcement precludes that um, but uh, once again it gets into some of the issues of overlap if the if the main partner institution is proposing the same activities in two different with two different companies that that could be turned into an overlap issue perhaps yeah i think it's a question of the small business concern is the one that's going to be the main focus and then the tech transfer out of the academic centers that one's a little more muddy if you will so the small business concern proposing the same thing in different regions that's overlap but the associated academic centers with the commercial organization i don't know i'd have to i'm going to have to check on that Okay, so yeah, that's another thing of homework, homework for us. Yeah. yeah. I just have another question, um, just to kind of triple check the, the small business concern. Um, I think what I heard is that it has to be a for-profit entity. Um, and because I'm thinking that's, you know, a tax status, you know, for profit or not for profit. So is that really the hard definition of it? There's a, there's a long list of eligibility information in the FOA. Okay. Um, the number one uh, point for that is that is organized for profit with a place of business located in the United States which primarily operates within the United States. So yes, it, it has to be a for-profit. Okay, thank you. The next question is, is the administrative core to be composed of both SBC officers and partnering institution representatives? Um, I think uh, or that could also, I think that, that actually would, would is that the internal advisory committee or is that the the administrative administrative that is yes it, so the so the, the the question was again is the administrative core to be composed of both SBC officers and partnering institution representatives yes next question is uh, may current uh, NIH commercialization support contractor participate or would this be considered a conflict of interest that's probably a conflict of interest, but I think I'll check that to make sure. We can, we can check on this one and uh, get back to you. Okay, let's, go, let's go down some more. Yeah, I think I see it. Um, and then there's what is the scope of biomedical disciplines that are considered to be important for this scheme? Is there a focus on a particular area? Um, my, um, the, the short answer is uh, the the particular area of interest would be uh, research that's within the NIH mission. And that's pretty broad. Yes, the recording. Uh, the question is: Will this recording be available later? Yes, this will be available uh, two days after the webinar. So we'll post it on the IDEA website. Can a non-profit, non-research institution be co-PI? Um, I am not actually sure of, of that question. Um, a co-PI, I, I don't know that a nonprofit, non-research institution would be part of the hub. It, it doesn't seem yeah. like, um, you know, the, the small business concern, the research institutions in the idea state, and then 
other research institutions in that idea state are what we're looking for as part of the network. Um, mm -hmm. A nonprofit, non-research institution doesn't seem like it would fit in this. Although, although in the context of, a, I was going to ask Alan, in the context of a co-investigator, someone they could have a subcontract with. Well, I think you asked the question, and the reviewers would be looking for, how does this organization contribute to spreading technology to the U.S.? And if there's a way that they do that, then potentially it would work. But, you know, I can't understand how a nonprofit, non-research institution is going to sink spread technology. Yeah. <clears throat> and then um, there's a comment, it may give the wrong impression if the same company competes and wins more than one center. I think we decided that because of overlap issues that um, that wouldn't happen, that, that, it, that a company could only get one of these, right? Right. Uh, the next question is, I was very confused if one company can submit uh, to two different regions, assuming that the people within the company are different so that, that there is no overlap. It's still it's the, the same company. Same question. The company it's the same the company, company, and conceptually, it's very similar. Yeah, applications come from companies, not individuals. Good. Um, when you look at curricula, is there any bias to certain existing materials like i -Corps? For the SBC creation of IP, it will be important for commercialization. So, yes, you're right. ICOR is one example of a way to do this. There are other examples of, of ways to do this. So, you, you know, you, my advice would be to use your best judgment. There's no bias one direction or the other. The next question is, uh, must the applicant have a participating institution uh, in each state, or is there flexibility on this? Uh, it, it should be an inclusive uh, regional network, so all the states have to be involved in the network. So at least, at least one institution should be part of the hub from each state. Is there a significant benefit of being able to have cash matching commitment from the state government or from commercial partners participating in the Idea Hub? That's a good question. It's, it, it's, it's difficult for us to, to get into the minds of what the reviewers are, are thinking, but you should look at the review criteria um, that there is no, there is no cost, cost sharing requirement, but there are a number of, of, of criteria that go into uh, determining what the strength of the strengths of the application are, and um, so that would be my advice: is to go back and look at the at the review criteria. I was surprised to hear that lab space was an indication of commitment. There are no wet lab activities relevant to this FOA. Please clarify. I I I think that the okay so. That you're, you're right. That does sound odd, out of context. But we're talking about um, partnering. There are institutions that ha are more research intensive than others in idea states. And one of the <coughs> imagine that there were there were situations where um, people needed um, needed space to do activities that they couldn't do at their home institution. Could they get? Um, could they do those experiments on another campus, for example? You know, for example, does that? For any space, for any activities they propose. Yeah. yeah you're not trying to limit what an applicant can suggest. Um, if they have an idea that involves generating intellectual property in a lab, then you know, that option should be there. Uh, I don't think it's a requirement, and I don't think there are any hard requirements on any of these. It's just it's an option. Mm -hmm. Is, yeah. it better to, is it better to include partner institutions with tech transfer capabilities, or should we try to include institutions that need more assistance in this area? I, mean, I would look at it as it's a blend of the strengths. Yeah. If your institution is strong in tech transfer, and then you have other institutions that have ideas but no way to get them out, and that would be one scenario. Another would be 
you've got great ideas, but no tech transfer, so what do you do with it? So I mean, it's a blend. I agree. I agree that, you know, what is the, what, what is the way that you can, um, you know, it, it's a balance. What is your, uh, what are your current activities? That would be part of your strengths, but then what is the impact of the activities to how do you, what's, what's the slope of the curve from, from now to, you know, three or four years from now of uh, improvement of the, the infrastructure in your, in your region? Okay, so regarding the commercialization plan, is that focused on sustainability of the effort, commercialization of products from the beneficiaries of the training or mentoring, or commercialization slash sales of the training materials themselves? All of them. It includes all of these. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, is there preference between a participating? I don't. One, one question. Uh, it's not really a question. It's more of a, a statement. <laughs> um, is there preference between a participating public or a private university? No. No preference. No. What help is NIH giving, referring to your cooperative point made early in the presentation? Can we expect NIH to dictate certain methods or processes? This part comes after the award is made, you know, uh, in terms of cooperative mechanism, you know. Once the awards is made and the hubs are funded, then NH will have substantial input in terms of the planning and uh, overseeing the activity in the hub. Is participation and support by multiple institutions from each state encouraged? Sure. Yes. Uh, what if one state only has a few institutions that have come together and do not want to partner because they are proposing their own hub? How should we get support from that state if none of the institutions want to partner, but we have support from all of the other states? That seems a tricky part. Yeah, that's the first year. Well, they need to deal with it. That's happened in idea state. Where they can't compete, they need to come together. Yeah, one part of the goal of this is getting people to work together, and I think that's sort of a bad sign if uh, at the at the application stage that that these things are coming to the surface. NIH has done several hubs, from genomics to data sharing to chemistry and and screening, and I think all of those have dealt with the same types of issues, and they get resolved. Uh, the next question, any incentives to include MSI? Do you mean by, uh, minority serving institutions? Then yes, of course. Um, so it seems that that's a similar question for any incentives to include underrepresented groups. Oh, okay. Any incentive? I don't know what you mean by incentive, but that and a, a key part of the NIH and NIGMS mission is to broaden the the uh, diversity of the biomedical workforce. So this uh, is this FOA intended to one create a single regional tech transfer office to facilitate the regional transfer of, of technology through the Office of Research to accommodate for what has been identified by NIH by NIH Ideas 2014 workshop on SBIR SGTR as existing weak local tech transfer offices, or two, to support a network of local tech transfer offices and their affiliated existing accelerators to work together collaboratively to provide resources with the small business concern as the lead. There, those are two different models for doing it. I think you just have to weigh your options based on the conditions on the ground where you are. Uh, in case NIH has funded similar programs before, could you please give examples of the kinds of industry partners that would be the best fit for NIH IDEA hubs? Probably the ones that match the technology that you're working on. And it doesn't make sense if your particular areas are strong in um, cancer research, for example that you would be interested in doing environmental impact studies. 
Um, you know, it just depends on what, what you see as the strength of your area and what you have in terms of industrial partners that are around you. Yeah. We, and we really can't dictate that. Or no, no. But one thing you could do is go uh, into NIH Reporter and search for small business grants that are doing the sorts of things that you're interested in doing. And that, that's one way that you can identify organizations or companies, I should say, that have been successful in getting grants um, in this sort of stuff. And you could all, always reach out to them. What will be desired roles for local tech transfer offices, if any, in this regional technology transfer accelerator hub for IDS State? Yeah, I mean, if they, if if there are local if there are local tech transfer organizations that have expertise that would benefit this this project, then they ha they have a role to play. Yeah, they can partner with the hub and then you know, share the resources and sort of you know, provide uh, expertise as the case may be. They can contribute to course development. They can contribute to regional seminars. They can contribute to business development activities. Uh, there are a whole range of things right. that they can do. Yeah, this will also strengthen the application. And you know, if you can include those as a partner, you know, the local uh, technology transfer offices, in the proposal. Is it? Yeah. Are there are there any other questions? Well, I mean, if there are not uh, more questions. I mean, at this time, I mean, you can always send it to us. Uh, by email, uh, we'll try to address those questions, and we'll make available the recording of this uh, webinar and the slides uh, on the IDEA website uh, within two days, after two days. And I was going to ask, uh, the FOA, I see the notice of intent to publish the FOA um, on the internet, I found that, but the actual FOA, is that out? Yeah. Yes. It was published in October 20th. Uh, so the number is RFA-GM-18-001. RFA-GM-18-001. Beautiful. And it also has a link, you know. Uh, Search on Google. Slide. Go right there. Yeah, yeah you just Google it. <laughs> That's what I do. So you will see it right away, you know, yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, okay. Thank you all for joining the webinar and uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.